Chapter 2 Kate I feel off. Like hungover, but I haven't been drinking. I usually feel a little queasy and sleepy, but that's from the meds and I'm used to it. Today, I feel more different than usual because I did something I shouldn't have and I know it. I shouldn't have gone there. That wasn't part of the plan. I wasn't ready and in retrospect, I should have known better. I thought if I went to him, something would come to me. Anxiety, anticipation, a tingle, a possibility, something I couldn't quite put my finger on or drove me there. It wasn't until I was standing there, probably a few feet from him, that I realized it was a mistake. Honey, you're feeling okay? My eyes flick up to my husband, Mark, then drop again. He's balding worse than Prince William, and the chandelier over the table reflects off of his shiny head. I smile over at him and nod as I drag my fork through my dinner plate. I'm just despondent. I feel like a failure after today. I'm alright, I mumble. What's going on with you? Did you take your meds today? You know I did. You insist on being in the room when I take them. Mark gets up anyway and walks through the dining room to the kitchen. I hear him open the cabinet where we keep my pill case. Every Sunday, he divides them up by day and night, medications, and places them into their positions in the plastic container. On occasion, if I become too agitated and Mark feels like I need it, I get a Haldol shot. These are locked up in a time-release safe that Mark thinks I can't get into. That shit puts me down in a hurry, so I make it a point to not get too agitated. I hate how drunk and delirious I feel after I wake up. I hear him pop open this morning's slot, then snap it closed. It's empty, as it should be. The Cymbalta, Topamax, Risperdal, Clonopin, and Naltrexone, along with the multivitamin and the omega-3 capsules, are all gone, down the hatch. Or so he thinks. He doesn't need to know what I do with the pills instead of taking them. Mark is a doting, generous, caring man. I'm lucky to have him, and he puts up with a lot. He's lost a lot of people in his life. His parents died when he was young, and he was an only child of only children. Hence, he's one of those Captain America types that likes saving people. I'm sure that's what he thinks he's doing. Saving me. He's been doing it since we met. He gave me a job at Silver Screen Media right out of college, managing content development for his smaller projects. From there, I moved on to post-production for independent films and videos. Mark took me under his wing, let me grow and develop my skills under his tutelage. By day, we were a great team, and he was my mentor. By night, I was usually bent over his desk with my dress bunched up around my hips while he took me from behind. Mark was a moderately attractive man with an air of magnetism on the fringes of Hollywood, willing to bend over backward and keep a pretty woman around. He was in awe of me and didn't have to work hard to keep his attention. Of course... I fell for him. By then, the mental imbalance I had been battling since I was a teenager began to rear its ugly head. I couldn't control the thoughts that swirled, the darkness that clouded my judgment, obsessions, ideations, fixations, followed by episodes of mania and actions that made sense at the time but in retrospect were inappropriate. I had a few really rough, dark days and almost gave up. I could quit my job, move out of my expensive but sparse apartment, go back to Fresno and the care of my parents, or stay, move in with Mark, let him take care of me, put someone else in the driver's seat for a change. I think my parents were relieved that I chose the latter. I'd have someone else legally responsible for me and my mental health, watching my behavior, making sure I was on medication and took it regularly. Mark's proposal was rushed and romantic. We flew off to Vegas on a Thursday, had a drive through chapel wedding, and a weekend of lewd, raunchy sex in a penthouse suite. On Monday, we began the search for a psychiatrist who could prescribe medication to ease my symptoms. Like most people who don't understand mental illness, Mark was only concerned about controlling my behaviors. I hear the pill case drop into the cabinet, and Mark returns to his spot, scooting his chair up to the table. Do you want to talk about it? He asks softly. Wild horses could not drag today's detour out of me. 
I need Mark to believe I am stable and functioning. I've been doing well for the past few years. No episodes, no outbursts, no incidents where Mark has to visit me as Cedar Sinai because I've been admitted on a 5150 hold after I broke into the L.A. home of Sebastian Knight, lead singer of the band Nightlife. I've been infatuated with him since I was in middle school. I chose to go to school at UCLA chiefly to be near him. I won't say I'm the reason he tried to unload the place, but I'd heard his wife was not amused. It went on the market after my incident, but didn't sell due to the rundown homes around it. It's the nicest dump in the neighborhood, you could say. It remains empty, which I only know because I still drive by there sometimes, hoping he'll stop by to do some work on the property or something. Mark does the best he can to be patient. I do my best to be grateful for what he provides for me. I'm still technically on sabbatical from Silver Screen, though I haven't worked in years. It's important to Mark that I be allowed to live a soft life to keep down stress, so I don't do anything but volunteer for his favorite charities and stare at these walls. The mix of medications make me boring and lethargic, so I've been secretly skipping doses just to feel like myself. A few years ago, Mark got a new client a singer, songwriter, actor, and musician who was a big deal ages ago in a pop group. He went solo, was dropped, then got a new deal. His label needed to prop him up with slick, shiny digital collateral, and Mark was the man for the job. After a few getting-to-know-you sessions at the office, Mark discovered that he and his then-girlfriend lived a few blocks from us, so he invited them over for dinner. The moment I met Josh, heard the music, listened to him talk, a flame that had been smothered and tamped down flickered to life. He was a leading man, handsome, charismatic, and genuine. His voice was like honey dripping with sensuality and charm. His eyes were the brightest blue, his hair a perfect mix of dark brown and distinguished streaks of gray. I was drawn to him. Josh and Mark were friendly enough to wave when they saw each other. They hang out now and again, meet up for coffee and talk shop. Mark finished up the project and delivered it to the label. It was brilliant, but didn't do what Josh thought it would do for him. Later that year, he made a decision to pivot to management with promises to use Mark's firm from time to time. He'd said he wanted to start a family. Slow down a little. With no need to listen to the music again, the CDs languished in Mark's office, so I took them and dove headfirst into his work. Solo albums, group releases, every TV show guest spot. I spent hours watching and re-watching his Mickey Mouse Club audition. He was just so earnest. I could not stop thinking about him. I found myself staring at photos of him online, driving by his house to see if I could catch a glimpse, holding conversations with him in my mind where he told me that he had feelings for me, that we were both committed to other people. He said to hang on, to wait for him. Someday we'd be together. He'd tell me how in the music. He'd send me a message specifically in a song. That way no one else would know what we were planning, like a secret message box that only I could open. Something stirred inside me that I hadn't felt in years. I recognized the dopamine hit of having someone new to obsess over, the giddy joy in my soul at the prospect of a new relationship, the drama of not being able to be together but dreaming about the day when we could. All of it felt familiar. I ignored the warning signs because I finally felt alive again. I was blissfully drowning in everything that was J.C. Chassay. I didn't want to be rescued. I sank deeper and deeper, listening to the songs nonstop, reading between the lines of every lyric, even watching new interviews to decipher any messages he might be sending me. So, no. Mark doesn't need to know that I tried to visit a former pop star at his place of business. I would have no reason to go there, and even I couldn't invent an excuse he would believe. Instead, I take another stab at my dinner and force myself to take a few bites, act normal, play the loving, devoted wife, and bide my time. Thank you for joining me for this little snippet. I hope you enjoyed it. 
If you would like to read it, you can find it at my website. It's booksbydlwhite.com slash freebies. Scroll all the way down to the bottom. I formatted several fan fiction stories, some of my best work, into ebooks. So you can add it to your e-reader and read at your leisure. If you'd like to read the whole glut of stories, you can find them at nsync-fiction.com slash archive. I write under the name Miss M. I truly hope you enjoy them, but please keep in mind these stories are not edited. They may need some development. They may need some proofreading, but this is what I do for fun, so... I don't really worry about that kind of stuff when I'm writing fan fiction. Have a wonderful week. We'll talk again next week.